Good morning, everyone. We are very Good pleased morning. to welcome you to the presentation of our publication, Contemporary Lyric Poetry and Transitions Between Genre and Media. This book has been published in open access as volume two of our international journal from Co for comparative cultural studies based at Trier University. We especially welcome all the authors who have contributed to this volume and our guests who will give us a taste of their contribution to this publication today. These are Heike Paul, Claudia Bentin, Ilya Kukulin and Jacob Edmund who will present today in this order. Unfortunately, not all authors of this volume can be here today, but we are very happy that many of them can be here. Thank you. The contributions to this issue were written within the framework of the DFG Center for Advanced Studies, Russian Language Poetry in Transition, Poetic Forms, Addressing Boundaries of Genre, Language, Culture and Society across Europe, Asia and the Americas and were originally presented at meetings and conferences, including a huge panel, better to uh -huh. say a stream, organized by the editors of this volume. That means Ralf Müller and I, at the International Conference of the International Network for the Study of Lyric in Lovan in 2019, entitled Bet The Bet Venus of Lyric. This panel, as well as this volume, represents a product of our collaboration. And Ralf Müller, who um, has been a research fellow at our center in Trier in 2017-18. Now we briefly introduce you to the topic of the volume and give you an overview of all essays. And then our four authors will subsequently present. And finally, um, there will be an open discussion in which we invite everyone to participate with questions or comments. Now I give over to Ralf Müller. Well, uh, thank you, Henrike, uh, for this introduction and, and a warm welcome uh, from my side to all. It's such a pleasure to, to, to meet so many of you, if, even if it's just in a, a digital way, but, 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 but um, I enjoy, I simply enjoy and take pleasure from, from seeing you uh, this way. Um, uh, the title uh, of the Lausanne Conference led us to examine uh, in what ways lyric poetry is defying uh, conventional ideas of presenting lyric poetry. It's, yes, we could say transition between genres, media. So uh, why is this uh, important? According to the conception uh, to a, a widely held conception of poetry, a uh, poem is monolingual printed in a fine booklet with left aligned lines and appears in a complete and inalterable form. Recent lyric poetry, however, especially since the turn of the millennium is increasingly exploring previously unfamiliar publication formats. It is breaking away from uh, conventional modes of publication. Um, <clears throat> so, continuing the innovation of the historical avant-garde, some poetry has left the page altogether and found new spaces for presentation. Can you still hear me? There was a, some a little interference, sorry. Yes, it's okay. Uh, well, well, for instance, installation art, uh, micro poetry appears in public space. Uh, we can see billboard poetry that incorporates urban or rural spaces that were previously uh, not associated with poetic experiences before. And uh, poems on buildings, objects, and even bodies as tattoos, public reading and performances, reading poetry. I mean, it has been around for a long while, but it has gained new momentum worldwide. So this phenomena may not be entirely new in themselves. The first poem recordings date from 1889. However, they are more readily available thanks to digital transmission. Last but not least, the internet plays a prominent role. Poetry beyond the format of the book is written, read, and heard or watched on a wide variety of digital platforms. We could say poetry has a special digital reach, not only on dedicated poetry sites and portals, but also on blogs, social media, platforms like Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. <clears throat> and authors, of course, authors' personal uh, websites. 
These new modes of publication coincide with an increased hybridization of poetry with other media in recent years. Hybrid genres have also developed beyond the internet, building upon established combinations of poetry with music or film. Multimodal poetry, as we would like to call it, tends to hybridize cultural, stylistic, and intertextual intermediate references, but also to introduce dialogic and participatory uh, processes. Furthermore, it dehierarchizes social relations and build upon polyphonic forms of subject. Behind such rather spectacular forms, more conventional literary poetic hybrids may seem to recede in the background, although these two have uh, developed with comparable intensity and diversity in recent decades. By using epic verse, montaging different generic modes of verse and prose, extending cycles of poem, various literary works find new ways to introduce forms of narrativization and even dramatic devices into lyric poetry. Conversely, drawing on the literary historical traditions of generic blending in their respective literatures, more and more large genres hybrids, epic, novel, drama, etc., display salient features of lyric or even use lyric poems. Contemporary conditions of migration, mobility, digitalization are also increasingly pushing, pushing poetry out of national fields into transnational space. As the borders between literatures and languages blur, borders between cultures and societies are also crossed, shifted, and dissolved. However, poetry that emerges transnationally does not appear everywhere in a globally uniform fashion, even if the trend towards lyric hybrids can be seen worldwide and international transfers are visible in emerging hybrid genres. These hybrid genres may refer to well-known examples of prototypical relevance. However, their forms and their functions nevertheless develop quite differently. Well, different in what ways? Languages, on the one hand, and regionally specific literary fields and the social context, on the other hand, play differentiating roles. The literary memory of languages stimulate the continuation of certain traditions across national borders, while regional literary fields represented by the interactions of institutions and persons in specific political and social context, constitute frameworks that have a steering influence on realization of the creative potential, as well as processes of reception or transfer. The forms of poetry outlined above have one thing in common. They are in transition. In this issue, Essays on recent poetry reveal these transitional features in terms of publication formats, media forms, genres, and so on. The examples presented in these case studies display new characteristic and or functions in the context of literary history, which demand investigation and the further development of theoretical concepts and methodologies. Well, Unfortunately, uh, well, not unfortunately, I mean, we are so happy that, that this volume has uh, so many contributions and uh, unfortunately, we cannot present all of these contributions in a uh, specialized uh, presentation. But nevertheless, we would like uh, to mention the breadth of uh, contributions that have been written, especially for this volume. And most of them have been presented in Lausanne, but many of them have uh, come uh, to this volume at a later stage. And Henrique is providing an overview of, the of these <clears throat> contributions. Yes, thank you, Ralph. Um, before giving you a, a brief overview um, of the contributions, I will sh show you um, the issue. Now I share my screen and you can see our volume here. So, now I will give you the overview. I start and um, the, the contributions are co grouped into three sections. The first one, transitions between genres. The second, between reading and performance. And the third, transitions between lyric and other media. Now about the first section. It opens with an essay by Rüdiger Zimner, 
His essay demonstrates a strong trend in recent poetry to transcend the boundaries of national literatures along with their languages, writing systems and cultural historical backgrounds. Such poetry is in transition in several respects and opens up a transnational space of encounter and of cultural diversity. In this space, conflicts of difference or the abolition are not at the center of attention, but rather the play with continuities and contrasts that form individual configurations, such as, for instance, Kassar's polyglot mosaic poems, which Zimner considers global memorial. Yoko Tawada is another prominent example of a transnational author whose writing moves between different languages, especially Japanese, German, and English, and literary or cultural spaces. In her case, writing from the in-between goes hand in hand with this transition between generic divisions. As Yasmin Böhm demonstrates, Using the example of parallel versions of a work by Tawada, written in two languages, German and Japanese, transition is carried out differently depending on the language and literary space in play. This comparative reading illustrates how transnational and transcultural literature can remain determi determined by its orientation towards a primary and still national linguistic and literary space. So I scroll a little bit further. Ralph Müller uses the example of Monika Rink to show how she transcends the still dominant expect expectation of lyric poetry in Europe by combining typical features of lyric poetry and prose. For example, by weakening the verse criterion of her text and employing discursive procedures and terms which are simultaneously combined with poetic devices in a language of reference to philosophical and literary historical traditions. In my essay, I demonstrate how in recent decades, a certain combination of distinct genre features has led to the emergence of a new form of the novel, the novel in poems I named it. Thus far, the novel and poems as an independent genre has been largely confined to the, to the Anglophone world. At the same time, however, the novel and poems can be considered a subsegment of a broad spectrum of large format hybrid poetry whose diversity of form has not developed uniformly or prototypicality. Peter Hühn examines such occasional hybrid formations of poetry in novel, drama, and film. As Peter Hühn points out, when lyric merges with film, drama, and theater by combining multiple voiced, voices, it leads to a further dissolution of a single, delimitable subjectivity once considered constitutive to lyric poetry. This trend can be observed in greater detail with regard to the spread of performance forms in contemporary lyric poetry to which a second section transitions between reading and performance is dedicated. Thomas Austenfeld claimed that every reading of a poem performs its speaking, whether silently or aloud or even its singing, but that each case represents an individual performative instance. Each reading thus leads to a performative impersonation, imaginative or acted out of the poem. The performance is at the same time always an interaction because the text implicit control procedures are only carried out in the interpretation by the performer through activation, fading out, transformation, and substitution. Accordingly, Anna Beers emphasizes the difference between the poem as a written text, which potentially offers a multiplicity of possibilities for interpretation and performance, and the singularity of one particular performance. Anna Beers makes it clear that the analysis 
of performed poetry cannot be carried out without methods borrowed from other performance arts. However, such analysis also requires the development of specific theoretical and methodological concepts that take into account the particularities of poetic performance. Poetry further interacts with other performative media. The intermediate interaction of poetry with music in collaborative performance has its own tradition, which has developed differently in various languages and cultures. In Russia, this interaction is a relatively new phenomenon, as Ilya Kukulin points out. In its intermediate expansion, poetry becomes a joint collective work that is momentary and singular in performance and also gains political significance as a new form of social communication. According to Justina Jagushik, multimodality, the singular spontaneity of performance and the plurality of subjectivity also characterize the phenomenon of women's poetry theater in the People's Republic of China. Here, poems are transformed into theater pieces through the staging with a focus on embodiment. Poems of the women's poetry movement work together with actors and theater directors, as well as artists, musicians, dancers, etc. Poetry theater is thus developing as an independent art form which combines the generic languages of both poetry and theater and represents a socially relevant and collaborative cultural activity emanating from individuals rather than institutions. Sure. Collaboration, fluidity, and the concept of the event are also particularly important for reproducible, intermediate, and multimodal poetry. Hence, the contributions in the third sections, transitions between the lyric and other media, address the play between boundaries of established media forms in new poetry. However, multimodal and digital poetry develops upon the appropriation and transformation of devices already present in text-based poetry, as Majri Parloff has shown. Peter Stein Larsen elaborates on her idea. For instance, digital poetry takes up the analog techniques of avant-garde poetry and develop them further in a transformative way. Similarly, Jacob Edmund shows that even the seemingly unusual transitions between poetry and news media in different literatures, in this case, Russia, America, and China, can each be linked to national specific predecessors. As Sonja Klimek points out, authorial poetry clips plays a new emphasis on authorial subjectivity and pseudo-authenticity in which author and performer appear in personal union. Other poetry clips, however, pursue the already long established genre of the poetry video. Such clips once again break down the category of subjectivity, for instance, through forms of duplication and montage of forms of blurring subject-object relations, as Klavdia Smola shows with examples from Russian poetry. Another worldwide trend of poetry acts off the page and is often designed as micropoetry. In this case, poetry merges with various cultural and communicative practices, as Heike Powell explains, using the example of billboard poetry as a typical American phenomenon. Claudia Bentin illustrates how public poetry expose the lyric and or poetic quality of the poem as a marker of difference in order to become perceptible in the urban space as an artistic intervention. Poetry in urban spaces literally puts the poem in transition by recontextualizing it situationally and momentarily, creating an encounter that is simultaneously personal and anonymous. Poetry here occurs with fleeting contact and produces partial contaminations between text, context, authors, and recipients, 
who can, however, be reincorporated as co-authors and co-agents. In such cases, the focus on transition is thus turned back upon the medium of the poem itself. The poem is used as a virtual site of encounter and passage between times, cultures, and languages, that is, at the place of transit. Thus, it is precisely the versatility of the term transition that makes it suitable for describing various forms of border crossing, displacement, and transformation in recent poetry. Even if transition is a general category for defining historical change, it also represents a time-specific feature of the last decades, as we are convinced, in which poetry has demonstrated a paradigmatic capacity, capacity for taking on new manifestations. Transition happens today not only as a change of state or in the form of a static hybrid space. It has taken on a quality of permanent dynamic transformation. As recent poetry displays, transition releases individuality understood as the capacity, capacity of a self-evolution and self-determination. After this brief overview, we now come to the second part of our program. Um, the present, presentation of selected contributions. I now hand over to Rolf, who will be the moderator for the first two presentations. Uh, thank you, Henrike. Um, as mentioned before, we could not uh, include, of course, uh, we, we just simply wanted to provide an overview of a few examples, and we decided to split these overviews into two groups. So also to animate a little bit the discussion. So we'll have two presentations at the beginning, then we'll have a discussion, then we'll have another two uh, presentations, and then we'll have another discussion. I, um, I would invite you to maybe also write your questions into the chat, or uh, of course afterwards, uh, you can also open just your mic and ask your question directly. Um, well, it's up to you what you prefer, which way you prefer. Uh, and, and what I wanted to mention too, um, we have also chosen two contributions that have not yet been presented in Lausanne, two that have been presented in Lausanne like this, uh, 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 get a little mix, a little overview of, of what has been done in Lausanne. Uh, maybe even if you had been in Lausanne, you will see something new uh, today. So um, uh, the first group is made up uh, by uh, Heike Paul and Claudia Bentin. And uh, I would suggest that the first to speak is Heike Paul, if you're ready, she is uh, good, yes. <laughs> uh, she's chair of American studies at University of Erlangen Nuremberg. And uh, uh, you have been awarded with the uh, DFG Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Prize in 2018. I'm, I'm very proud uh, to meet uh, finally a prize winner. Uh, I've only heard about this prize uh, in the past. And uh, well, um, uh, I will now turn the floor over to Heike Paul, please. Thank you very much and good morning to all of you. It's good to see you. Um, I uh, want to, um, just before I start my presentation, apologize that I will have to leave a little early today due to another commitment in my calendar I couldn't get rid of. But um, yeah, so I will start right away and I hope you can see my screen. <laughs> yeah, it's an honor to present and uh, yeah, I will be um, 10, 12 minutes and trying to give an angle um, to my presentation here, to my contribution. So a trajectory of billboard poetry is what I uh, wrote on for this new issue. And the occasion and point of departure for this essay originally was a certain dissatisfaction on my part with the reception of the usually successful award-winning 2017 film, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. The enthusiastic response to the film focused mainly on the star persona of Frances McDormand, and it became increasingly caught up in the Me Too debate raging in Hollywood and gaining traction at around the time of the film's appearance. So the latter seemed to determine to a large extent the reading of the film in terms of its plot, uh, focusing on sexual violence and abuse. 
Very fleetingly, viewers and critics commented on the aesthetic features of the film, prominently the three billboards that uh, also lend the movie its title. None of the reviews of the film took seriously either the medium of the billboard nor the writing on its walls, so to speak. So for the purpose of my own argument about the film, let me begin by suggesting that the three billboards make up what Maria Damon has described and defined as a micro poem. Considered in such a way, we may read them as a quasi haiku or at least as something similar to that well-known lyrical form. Raped while dying and still no arrests. How come, Chief Willoughby? In the film, which may be familiar to some of you, the female protagonist, Mildred Hayes, played by Frances McDormand, arranges for these lines to be displayed on the three billboards to remind the small town community of Ebbing, Missouri, and specifically the chief of police, of the unsolved crime that has dramatically impacted her life, the rape and murder of her daughter, Angela. The billboards, which had long been neglected, dilapidated signposts of the town's brighter past, so to say, all of a sudden become the center of controversy, leading to more communal friction and to brutal violence. So the micro poem begins with the description of a brutal crime without giving up the name of the victim. It goes on to indict the failure of police procedure and it culminates in a final accusatory question. Posing her question to Willoughby, Mildred's lines call um, not only on uh, the incompetence, but also the interest of the local police force in solving the case at hand. In what follows, the billboards are repeatedly vandalized, they are burned down, then put up again, uh, and so forth. And in short, they constitute what I would consider the spatial and symbolic center of the film. In a broader context, in, in a diachronic perspective, billboard poetry as one type of micro poetry sits at the intersection of aesthetic experience, consumer culture and political protest. To suggest only one angle in this brief preview, let me historicize a bit and point to the beginning of billboard poetry as part of mass advertising in the 1920s. Among those companies and corporations which have used billboard poetry as part of the advertising scheme, one certainly stands out, the Burma Vita Company from Minneapolis. In the United States, the Burma Shave poetry has become and still is a household name. It is a phenomenon of Americana, however, that is virtually unknown abroad. Burma Shave, a shaving cream and a liniment supposedly with ingredients brought in all the way from Burma, introduced a new cult of shaven corporate masculinity along with a new marketing strategy. Short poems on billboards that were displayed with increasing success on the roadside in most of the United States from 1926 until 1963. In the account of Frank Rosam, it all started in 1927 during the years of America's romance with the automobile and the open road. So as you can see here, the billboards were fitted to be 40 inches long and 12 inches high. Each billboard contained one line of a poem, capital letters. They were put six in a row usually and so displayed in serial fashion. To read the entire poem, one had to drive by a set of billboards. Those roadside billboards were displayed <clears throat> mainly in um, rural regions um, and suffice to say that almost 7,000 sets would be installed between Maine and Texas at any given time. The iconicity of this campaign and its poems on signs can well be argued when we pay attention to references to the Burma Shave billboards, for instance, in the notebook of Gertrude Stein, the song lyrics of Tom Waits. <laughs> um, this is a, his ballad. She's a juvenile delinquent, never learned how to behave. But the cops, they never think to look out in burn shame. And a whole set of films ranging from a getaway sequence in Bonnie and Clyde to a drunken prank in the river runs through it. References spanning New England, California, Maine, and again, Texas. Knowing about this piece of US billboard 
history, <laughs> the history of US Billboard poetry can inform our reading of the recent film. So let me in the little time I have left briefly establish some connections that I see between the two instances of roadside poetry. Here we see them next to each other. <laughs> Mildred Hayes' billboards in the film clearly evoke the roadside advertisement of a bygone era. As repurposed post-industrial ruins, as it were, and relics of an earlier and supposedly brighter phase of US consumer culture, that is in the heyday of Burma shave advertising, they are reminders of the economic downfall of the region. The sad state of the billboards at the beginning of the film also echoes the dysfunctional state of social relations in Ebbing and perhaps elsewhere in America, characterized by violence, neglect, racism, and misogyny. In some ways, the billboards bring to the fore, it seems, everything that is wrong in Ebbing, Missouri, reaching way beyond Angela's murder and its circumstances and the questionable police work around it. This is the scandal of the billboards. It is somewhat ironic that Mildred is at first belittled for renting the billboards on a road where supposedly nobody drives by anymore, only to find that obviously people go by there all the time, if only to see the billboards, which even receive local media attention. Mildred's billboards thus become the spectacle of protest, the spectacle of Ebbing, Missouri. The film not only resonates with ongoing violence against and discrimination of women in contemporary America, it also revisits such instances in the past. Clearly, the family as a site of violence and neglect and the car as an intimate site of power abuse also make us reconsider the subtext of earlier billboard advertising. Three billboards then on one level speaks back to the playful Burma shaved poetry in insisting that by producing an image of the family friendly father and freshly shaven corporate man, it has disavowed the violence of patriarchal car culture and rape culture all along. The representation of the ebbing rape and murder sever the ties between the imagery of the car culture and family values and reveal the car culture's complicity with rape culture and other systemic forms of violence that we find in Ebbing, Missouri. Rereading the Burma Shave poems with Mildred's poem in mind produces an uncanny lacuna of sorts. And finally, visually and aesthetically, the billboards outside Ebbing hybridize existing styles of billboard display in the US. Borrowed from advertisement, alluding to missing people ads, and last but not least, evoking forms and particular specimen of conceptual art. Often these days we hear about the two Americas, the divided states of America. <laughs> An analysis of billboard poetry, I want to suggest, can throw light on such divisiveness in specific ways and figure as an emblem of transitions of sorts, relating to popular and avant-garde aesthetics, as well as to the cultural function and work of poetry. So with this longer detour I have arrived at, I hope at a plausible <laughs> and hopefully also somewhat persuasive reading of one dimension of the Hollywood film and it's three billboards outside of Ebbing, Missouri. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, just one question, uh, Professor Paul. Will you have time enough to uh, also attend the uh, presentation by uh, Claudia Bentin, or do we need to take the question? Okay, very good, very good. In that case, um, and we will take your questions after the presentation by Claudia Bentin. Um, Claudia Bentin is chair of modern German literature at Hamburg University. Uh, principal investigator of the ERC project Poetry in the Digital uh, Age that has uh, started uh, this year, yes. And um, she is at present fellow at the uh, Trier Centre um, for Russian language poetry in transition. Uh, please, Claudia. Yes, thank you very much, Ralph, for the kind invitation and introduction. And I will open my presentation. Uh, so, can you see it? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, one change I would like to make. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I'm li I like to present uh, my article, Public Poetry Encountering the Lyric in Urban Space, uh, which was written in 2019. 
and is uh, the first initiation to, into a new research project that I'm presently conducting together with Norbert Gestring as research fellows at the University of Trier. As you can see here, Norbert Gestring is an urban sociologist. And um, the article is the first exploration of an interdisciplinary research project that brings together approaches from literary studies and urban sociology and will result in a book publication. And we are presently, as Ralph has already mentioned, both fellows at the TRIA um, Consortium or the Collaborative Research Center. Um, the project is dedicated to the visual and auditive presence of poetry in urban settings in the digital age. And um, I have very brief uh, examples as an introduction from my article. These are the, the um, uh, case studies that I uh, discuss in uh, more detail in the article. Um, for instance, poetry in motion, framed and ornamented poems and subway cars of different metropolises, as discussed in my article regarding New York City transit. Or large scale poetry on facades, be it temporary, for instance, through fluid light projections in the frame of art events, like the conceptual artworks by Jenny Holzer. An uh, example from Zurich is discussed in the article, uh, but also permanent, uh, not uh, fluid uh, inscriptions on, on uh, facades and walls, but also permanent inscriptions um, like the wall poems in Leiden, in the Netherlands, uh, that we are currently dis uh, researching. Acoustic forms of presentation in urban space are also relevant audible within the city's uh, space from technically enhanced spoken word events, for instance, the Poetry Slam in Hamburg that you can see here and I discuss in the article as well, to uh, more avant-garde poetic interventions, for instance, the declamation of poems at symbolic sites through a megaphone. Here's an example of a German poet in New Delhi. Um, and the project and also my article that I'm presenting here investigates both official poetry projects that have been approved by the city council, as well as more informal activities initiated through poets or inhabitants themselves and in such a way claiming their right to the city to quote a famous article by Henri Lefebvre. In question is not only the aesthetics of these different scriptural, artistic, or performative auditory works, by asking how the language used, contrary to advertisements, to signs, or to graffiti, is perceived as poetic. And that is one of the central questions. How is poeticity achieved, so to say? But public poetry is also investigated in the article and in the project from an urban sociology, sociology so, so sociological perspective by looking at the production of space through poetry in concrete sites. Urban planners and sociologists call this placemaking. And this is a very interesting and I think also a new idea of, of thinking of poetry as uh, an element of placemaking. And such approaches need to be related to concepts of public art. Uh, in art theory that emphasize in particular the aspect of site specificity and uh, the, the article um, has the title public poetry and so it's related to these uh, discussions and debates about public art uh, that for instance deal with concrete relations of an artwork uh, to the surrounding urban space on a formal but also maybe on a thematical level. And the question in this regard has also to be raised. And here I'm going a little further than in the article. I have not been aware of that so much. Uh, the question whether the the um, um, the artwork and the, of course also the um, concepts in the in the in, in the city um, administrative, uh, if they intend something that the art critic Christian Höller calls Störung und Entstörung. One might maybe speak of disruption and interference suppression. I was not totally sure. That's why I left the German uh, words here. So is the artwork or the poem is somewhat disturbing what is there, something like an like interruption or a disruption, or is it more on the, on the, other, on the other hand? So does it somehow um, confirm the sociocultural conditions or question them uh, in, in short?
This, the projects and articles uh, theoretical background relies on approaches from poetry research, from art theory, and interdisciplinary theories of space. And empirical approaches also include on-site exploration and interviews with passers-by, locals, poets, and initi initi initiators. As is shown in my article, the research is based on the premise that the urban sphere can no longer be adequately described by the classical dichotomy of private and public spaces. Through processes of privatization, commercialization, and surveillance, new types of space have developed that do not fulfill this di dichotomy any longer. For instance, shopping center, business improvement districts, as well as transit spaces that the anthropologist Marc Auger has described as non-spaces, spaces that lack history and identity. And these um, intermediate types of space are examples for this, this new development. One of the basic assumptions of the article, as well as the project, is that poetry often presenting itself as subjective, as a subjective mode of speaking, contributes in reflecting these changes. The article and study therefore asks how poetry is perceived in urban spaces, whether it creates irritation and questions internalized behavioral routines, for instance, whether it simply assimilates to trends of spatial development, or on the contrary, it, it motivates new or critical perspectives. So this was a short introduction. And now I will present one case study from my article, uh, namely Poetry in Motion um, in the New York subway. Oh no, I will show that a little bit. Uh, the subway can be considered a non-lieu non or non-place, a term coined by Auger to describe public spaces that cannot be defined as relational, historical, or concerned with identity. Non-places, according to him, are sites of transit, of anonymous transportation, consumption, and entertainment. For instance, airports, train stations, hotels, shopping malls, supermarkets. Um, humans, as OG emphasizes, are supposed to interact in these, uh, uh, in these transit, uh, transit spheres only with texts whose proponents are not individuals, but moral entities or institutions, uh, for instance, uh, if they uh, read science. And he further comments this peculiarity as follows, and here I, I unfortunately, I missed this interesting slide, I might show it later. So he, he um, remarks, uh, all the remarks that emanate from our roads and commercial centers from the street corner sides of the vanguard of the banking system, thank you for your custom, bon voyage, we apologize for any inconvenience, are addressed simultaneously and indiscriminately to each and any of us. They fabricate the average man or woman, one might say today, defined as the, uh, the user of the road, retail or banking system. The space of non-place creates neither singular identity nor relations, only solitude and similitude. OGE refers to the transportation system and to highways as non-placed, and non-placed, it seems, are often characterized by mobility, which is a kind of a, I think it's kind of a paradox, a place, a place, uh, a place that is moving is somehow a paradox, but I don't want to go any further into this. So the subway is, um, can be um, considered as an example of a non-place in that it facilitates mobility, it issues instructions, one is confronted with ads, and it, um, one necess necessitates orientation via maps, all while granting passengers a degree of anonymity. Um, I think I show this one because here you can see a poem in the earlier phase um, above. So in the first phase from 1992 to 2008, poems appeared on so-called overhead car cards at the very spot where one expect to find ads or next to ads, as you can see here. They were placed under a so-called, and now I go on because here you can see it better. It, they were placed under a so-called, 
uh, must head, must head featuring mosaic tile art from a number of subway stations below the title Subtalk, above the title Subtalk, uh, I think it's, it's wrong, and the MTA logo. The program um, disappeared, but it was relaunched some years later and is uh, still uh, um, found today. And now the poems appear on larger so-called premium square cards paired with a visual artwork and placed on a window level in the cars. It's obvious that the new format not only diff features different aesthetics, but also changes the mode of perception. Passengers are confronted now with framed and visually adorned poetry, which is further decontextualized from its surrounding. Here's another example where you can see it, why, why I speak of a frame. Um, when a passenger sits in front of a poem, others cannot read it. And what is more, the presentation resembles a picture on the wall, poetry as decoration, it seems. One of the recent, <clears throat> recently displayed poems is Notes on Longing by Tina Chang. It's, a, it's the example I also presented in Lausanne, but most of you don't uh, remember it probably in detail. Um, it smells on, uh, the poem goes as follows. It smells on after rain tonight, duck bones, a wounded egg on rice. On the corner, there's a shop that makes keys, keys that open human doors, doors that lead to rooms that hold families of four or seven that sit at a table. There's a mother who brings sizzling flounder on a white platter for the family whose ordinary mouths have been made to sing. Cheng's text is exemplary for poetry in motion. It is short, it is easy to grasp, and contains an imagery loosely related to riding the subway. For instance, the reference to a street corner shop making keys or the fact that many commuters are, are on the train go home for, after work for dinner. At the same time, the poem's title evokes a sense of longing and nostalgia particularly where traditional gender roles are concerned, thereby presenting the mother's role as something unreal, something of a bygone era or an imaginary past, perhaps in Asian countries such as Taiwan, where a part of the author's family still lives. Reading a poem like this in public, even silently, causes contradictory emotions, not only because it is slightly kitschy, but also because it thematizes personal emotions. From the perspective of social psychology, longing is a state of mind subway passengers try to avoid, as the habitus in such situations of anonymity and proximity demands distance and reserve. The public space of the city is characterized by a heterogeneity of actors. It is also, um, and it's also characterized by frequent encounters with strangers and by a spatial density of interactions. It is helpful to refer to Georg Simmel's notion of the metropolitan type, um, who, who claims that the urban character creates a protective organ against the profound disruption which, with which it which, with which the fluctuations and discontinuities of the external milieu threaten it. This was a quotation of Simmel. And according to him, social relations in big cities are functional and segmented. Urban urbanity on the one hand enables individualization, but on the other affects human behavior by creating physical and mental distance between urban dwellers. This characterization of the urban character has recently been applied to the, uh, to the blasé habitus of New Yorkers by the poet and writer Donna Stone Cipher, who was also uh, in Lausanne, and who claims that uh, they, these um, urban uh, characters, I quote her, donned their blasé attitudes along with their coats as they left their apartments. Poetry in the subway creates disruption precisely by calling into question this intellectual distanced persona, which is so typical for global metropolis, metropolis like New York, as you can see here in particular, the woman on the right. One might even feel caught or embarrassed when being observed while reading a poem that deals with longing, smell, taste, and private life. Correspondingly, one might experience the same when seeing others read the poem or simply sit in front of it with a bunch of flowers like this melancholic woman. 
However, most subway riders simply overlook the poem, which reflects the reserve of the citoyen described by Semmel as incapacity, incapacity or unwillingness uh, to add, uh, he says, to react to a new stimulus, as he puts it. So um, poetry in motion is one of the five uh, case studies in my paper. It, uh, the paper um, in, as a whole has examined different forms of public poetry in urban space, some men to be read, others to be heard. And such a performative use of poetry is unsettling or can be unsettling and calling for attention and allowing the recipient to pause and reflect, if only for a moment. It is the literariness of poetic language that causes de-automatization as it is presented in places and formats where one would expect advertisement, information or political protest. Public poetry as invested in the article either appears in significant sites of cities, for instance, town hall, riverside of a specific city, a race course and its surrounding public park, a college entrance, or on the contrary, in non-places, sites of transit, such as the subway, a shopping area or a street corner. So these are all the sites that I discuss in the article. In these urban places and sites, passers-by characterized by a mental habitus of distance and self-protection expect to read pragmatic texts. Encountering the lyric in urban space questions this persona by means of ambiguous language and in particular by directly addressing the reader or listener. It allows one to stumble over the words. Here I'm indi indirectly quoting uh, Viktor Slovsky, as, as you probably re uh, realize. So it allows one to stumble over the words and to reflect one on one's relationship to contemporary city life. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for your presentations and for the discussion. Now we will come to the second part uh, with the presentations of Ilya Kukulin and Jacob Edmund. We will start with Ilya. Ilya is Associate Professor at the Faculty of Humanities and School of Philological Studies at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. Ilya brought an article on the topic contemporary Russian poetry and the musical avant-garde performative intersections. I hand over to Ilya to Moscow now. Please, Ilya. I'm glad to participate in uh, this very interesting presentation. And thank you, Henrik, for organizing this event. Uh, and um, my uh, paper is focused on, uh, just a moment, on inter uh, so-called intermedial poetry. Uh, that is on the new type of uh, common performances of poets, uh, musicians, uh, and DJs or VJs. Uh, mm, uh, uh, new for Russia, but not new for some other cultures like German or American. There are some common concerts or of just musicians, for example, and poets. Uh, mm, but mm, these compositions are not songs and are not mere declamations. In this compositions, text is not self-sufficient, or at least it can be not self-sufficient. Uh, at the same time, the text is not supported or accompanied with music, uh, but in these uh, performances, music, poetry, and say activity of VJs or DJs can be seen as independent, but intertwined, uh, intertwined voices. Here, um, one can mention a number of common works of today poets and today's Russian academic avant-garde composers presented uh, in the 2010s. Uh, this kind of collective performances I discuss in the historical perspective of development of post-Soviet poetry. Uh, while introducing this paper or in my blog on the Facebook after uh, the number had been published, I wrote that I had attempted to answer a difficult question. Why in the 1990s, 90s, there were no uh, such collective initiatives of poets and composers in Moscow, in Russia, and why they started to flourish in the 2010s. And uh, let me to uh, proceed to my uh, presentation. Mm. Uh, 
here I um, should mention at least two important uh, examples. First of them is the festival Petronica that is uh, being provided uh, every, uh, as far as I remember, two years by a poet and composer, uh, Pavel Zagun. He is on the right uh, here uh, in Moscow, uh, where some uh, poets uh, uh, of the young and medium generation of the, the today's Russian poetry, somebody who are between 25 and say 55, they recite their 60, they recite their poems with a uh, common work uh, of Jacun and some his collaborators of DJ, as DJs and VJs. And this festival is more and more popular in Moscow. Uh, at the same time, the uh, festival, the fifth leg, Pyate Naga, is developed, uh, the festival of poetic videos. Uh, and for um, at the same time, the uh, poets who uh, very, uh, before the um, last years, uh, very rarely collaborated with the uh, composers, uh, they, uh, started to collaborate, like Andrei Sensinkov, who was mentioned today, uh, so to say classical poet, or um, he's avant-garde, but uh, he's a classical poet in the sense that um, he uh, wrote the poems as such. But uh, in the 2010s, he started to collaborate with diverse composers, uh, like Kirill Shirokov and some other. Uh, and uh, the, uh, um, uh, 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 the uh, example who, uh, which was uh, uh, most striking for me is the work by uh, Stanislav Lvovsky, uh, a poet, a historian, a political analyst, and uh, Jack of all trades, uh, who, lived, uh, who lives now in Oxford, uh, Britain. Uh, and he started to uh, he started to write the uh, sound music, so to say, uh, um, and uh, record his uh, own read poetic readings with this, uh, with this uh, sound music. Uh, let me uh, demonstrate you uh, uh, demonstrate you a short uh, example. Все, что понял, понимает человек. Все забудет, забывает человек. Человек, человек забудет. And so on and so forth. Uh, mm, and uh, mm, I'm interested uh, in the reasons and grounds of uh, this uh, widespread of uh, in, um, involving of poetry into intermedial uh, intermedial uh, interactions. Uh, I think I think that uh, mm, the cultural and medial foundations of this new practice are obvious. First of all, in the 2010s, technological access allowed even non-specialists to write music on a computer and overlay poetic readings, and the convenience of digital communication made it easy for authors living and working in different cities and even countries to collaborate uh, and 
Multimedia narratives, for example, in media itself, have become very common in the last decade, and multimedia performances have become an important art form. All these innovations encourage poets to collaborate with musicians uh, and lend the practice more and more cultural legitimacy. Uh, however, uh, there is probably another reason, and that is uh, less obvious, and that is social, social cultural, and uh, uh, has, it has also some political dimensions. The collaborations of poets and musicians, or the interactions of poetry and music within one work, as in Lvovsky's uh, poem, open spaces for unpredictable creative interplay. A poetic work in such a space become unfinished, open to new meanings and associations, precisely because musicians select or compose music that is not effective and does not enhance the dominant emotive tendency or, uh, of a text, but rather problematizes it. Music here shakes down the conventional flow of effect and emotional expectation to an even uh, greater extent than poetry does, but also preserves and even enhances our understanding of the poem as a communicative act addressed to an interloc interlocutor. Uh, performances by poets, and the poet Ronica, for example, mm, are organized in an emphatically collaborative manner. Participants are seated next to each other and pass on the micro microphone. Paradoxically, this multimedia performance visually acquires the features of joint collective work uh, at the si same time while problematizing the meaning of the words and the mm, every already meaning. Uh, I think that in today's world, such practices take on the meaning of utopian projects. Private communication is increasingly concentrated in social media and in this sense devoid of physicality while public communication is colored by the influence of ready-made genres born from the fields of politics, media, or corporate relations. New examples of public communications are emerging now, uh, or using the uh, metaphor I borrowed uh, from um, the work of theorist of media, Manuel Castells, the new protocols of communication. I think that poetry today uh, shapes the new protocols of communication. Mm. And these new examples of public communications uh, aimed, uh, are aimed at undermining uh, these ready-made genres, ranging from intermediate poetry to intellectual series, uh, such as the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, uh, uh, that uh, are pre present the, uh, uh, the female stand-up comedian who problematizes the common meaning of uh, urban uh, denizens of New York of 1950s. In Russia, such utopian collaborations are even more important because of the alienation of intellectuals from the social majority and highly developed uh, ritualization of public life. And here, uh, one can uh, recall the well-known book by Hans Tis Lemon, Post dramatic theater, uh, theater, post dramatic theater. Uh, Lehman writes uh, in this book that for several centuries in modern Europe, theater and drama were almost seen as anemic. But now we face emergence of uh, post dramatic theater. Dramatic background of theater uh, depicted once by uh, Aristotle with its plots, with its increase and decrease of emotional tension. All these features do not natural now. They do not seem natural now. And now uh, 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 theater performances express not plot, but emotional and existential states. I think that today we face growth of uh, frankly speaking, I don't like the uh, common prefix post, not post lyric, but trans lyrical, or post, not post lyrical, but trans lyrical or uh, non lyrical poetry, where a picture of a coherent self as an instant uh, is as an instance uh, allegedly responsible for a poetic work is not needed anymore or is not uh, so needed as in previous periods. Here, text can be seen as dissociated onto the separate elements that should be rearranged without being ascribed to a particular I or particular self. Their basis is a depersonalized intention, intention without a subject, but intention full of emotions, but not ascribed to a coherent image of self. Uh, and I think that 
uh, while working with uh, intermedial poetry, one can see something analogical. I think that uh, um, here poetry as an element of uh, this complex uh, whole picture, uh, uh, poetry is not self-sufficient or it can be not self-sufficient and to, uh, uh, how to say, to collaborate with, our, uh, with other elements of this common picture. And uh, uh, returning to the historical dimension of my story, I um, think that uh, the, uh, this, uh, um, uh, these new features uh, became to appear in Russian poetry starting with the beginning of uh, approximately 2000s. And uh, these new movements uh, emerged approximately in the eight of 90s on the margins of former empire, former Soviet empire, and uh, on the two uh, opposite margins. Uh, on the right, you can see the two members of the Riga-based Arbita group, uh, consisting of some poets who very often use uh, intermedial techniques in their poetic public poetic performances. Uh, here is uh, an element uh, of this a shot of their uh, performance, uh, a fan uh, slow show, uh, and they uh, recite their poems uh, with the, in a dialogue with the uh, strange sounds uh, emitted uh, by uh, some old radio sets, as you can see. And on the left, uh, you can see the picture of Igor Davletshin, who was uh, one of the first uh, proponents of uh, intermediate, poetic intermediality in Russia. He lived in uh, South Siberia, in uh, the city of Kemerova. He was an author of the one of the first in Russia courses of uh, video art. Uh, del uh, he delivered this course in Kemerov University and he uh, uh, unfortunately he died in a car accident in 2002. But before his uh, death, he uh, um, organized several festivals in uh, Kemerov when uh, uh, the poets worked with DJs. Uh, and uh, um, that was a, a, a emergence from the emergence uh, because uh, in uh, Riga, Arbita Group, uh, their activity had and now has very strong and very obvious for me post colonial dimension. Uh, there is, uh, I think, that there is no such post colonial dimension in new Russian. Uh, 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 new Russian uh, intermediate poetry. While, uh, why do I speak about uh, postcolonial dimension in Riga? Because they present Russian language not, not as in, uh, imperial language, not, uh, not as a language of uh, aggressive uh, ethnic minority, for example, uh, this uh, quality of aggression is ascribed often ascribed uh, in Latvia to uh, some Russians, but uh, they presented Russian as a European language that is uh, at the same time, not self-sufficient and can be included in diverse cultural context. And this is very important for resignification of Russian language in Latvian cultural space. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, in, uh, not on the, Mm, former periphery now in the newly developed, uh, newly uh, independent state like in Latvia, but in uh, Mo for, for Moscow and for Pe Petersburg, the uh, key critical uh, event was the common performance of uh, a composer, Sergei Nevsky. Uh, he is uh, living now in Germany and he works in Germany, but he presents himself as a Russian composer living in Germany. Uh, and uh, Kirill Medvedev, left uh, leaning poet, uh, he is on the right. Uh, uh, they uh, organized uh, a collective uh, event when uh, Kirill Medvedev 
recited his poems with the musical uh, in, uh, in a dialogue with the music of Sergei Nevsky in 2003. And that was a first collective performance. Uh, and after this, the um, intermedial poetry uh, began to quickly develop as a new, uh, not as a new protocol of communication, but as a very wide range of these new protocols of communication. Mm. Mm. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ilya. Um, our next speaker is Jacob Edmund, and um, he comes from New Zealand. He is professor for English uh, at the University of Otago, but he is well known for his comparative studies in Russian, Chinese, and English. In New Zealand, it is close to midnight. Thank you, Jacob, yet that you will present um, your article while <laughs> you have to sleep <laughs> this night. So thank you, Jacob. I hand over to you. It is the shortest day of the year here. So you're at the summer solstice and at the winter. So it is a long night, but <laughs> we're not so far into it yet. Uh, I just wanted to um, say thank you, Henrika, for the introduction. Um, um, <clears throat> to Ralph too for um, your work together in editing the collection. Um, it's a real honor and privilege uh, to be part of it. And um, thank you to the other presenters. It's, it's wonderful to speak with you um, this, this morning, this evening, this afternoon. Um, I'll just um, get on to uh, what I'm going to present today. What I will do, um, I'm going to share the screen, make sure that. Um, Okay, so what I'm going to do today is not exactly present, I'll present material that relates to the paper, but hopefully also builds on it so that those of you who have already read it <laughs> are not completely bored. So what does our access to ever increasing amounts of news and information from around the world um, bring to us? Um, it might seem to bring, <clears throat> why does it seem to bring uh, not global understanding, but paralyzing con confusion? It's not a new question. Two and a half centuries ago, a witty new satirical genre of poetry began doing the rounds in the London papers. This, uh, this new poetic form was called by its creator a cross reading and had involved reading across the columns of the newspaper to produce lines like, yesterday the new Lord Mayor was sworn in and afterwards tossed and gored several persons. Or on Tuesday last, an address was presented that happily missed fire and the villain made off. In presenting this first published example of a cross reading in 1766, the author, one Caleb Whiteford, publishing under the pseudonym Papyrus Cursor, explained his poem as a response to the curious jumble of the newspaper with its mixed composition of politics, religion, picking of pockets, deaths, marriages, bankruptcies, executions, lottery tickets, India bonds, Scotch pebbles, Canada bills, French chicken gloves, auctioneers, and quack doctors. The hodgepodge or mess medley of the London newspaper, Whiteford noted, led some to throw down the newspaper in a state of confusion. Whiteford presented his cross-reading genre as a new method of reading, that both highlighted and offered a potential solution to this overwhelming bombardment of information. Over the past two and a half centuries, writers have responded to a growing sense of global interconnectedness and complexity that has been imagined through and in part driven by increasingly ubiquitous news and information media. We can track the sense of interconnectedness and confusion from Whitefoods response to the rise of the newspaper in the 18th century through the information revolution of the late 19th and early 20th centuries to the online news and information of our own era. Each information revolution has increased the volume of news and the speed with which it spreads around the world, producing contradictory tendencies towards global uniformity and complexity. On the one hand, the news has played a key role in producing the modern notion of the world as a whole and of global interconnection, as in the India bonds, Scotch pebbles, Canada bills, and French chicken gloves that Whiteford signs. On the other, it has produced a sense of disjunction 
fragmentation and confusion, and so a sense that the world cannot be grasped, or to use Frederick Jameson's borrowed term, cognitively mapped in its totality. The late 19th century newspaper, for instance, helped produce globalized systems of ideas and discourses from spiritualism to socialism, even as it reflected the growth of internal complexity in the world's societies. Digital media have led to further globalization, but also to new divisions and complexities, to a growing uniformity in news media practices that nevertheless amplify national differences. Digital media increase the personalization and ideological segregation of our engagements with news media, but like the 19th century newspaper, they also spawn new forms of transnational solidarity and collective action. As Eric Cayo notes, the history of the world of the work of art is always simultaneously a history of the idea of the world. Whiteford's cross-reading form produces a world that is both confused and globally integrated. It is a jumble, hodgepodge or mess medley of information that nevertheless connects Lord Mayors and villains, India and Canada, politics and chicken gloves and everything else in between. The responses of writers like Whitefoot to the news can teach us about the history of modern imaginings of the world and how they interact with the history of modern media. They highlight the seemingly paradoxical situation whereby news media give expression to the idea of the modern world as a global and noble whole, but do so in a just disjunctive form that seems to render impossible or nonsensical the task of conceiving of the world as a coherent and single whole in the first place. Writers like Whiteford deployed not just the contents of the news, but also its hodgepodge or mess medley form, namely the cut up, collage, montage or juxtaposition of various discrete news items and advertisements. Although pioneered in the 18th century by Whiteford, Georg Christoph Lichtenberg and others, I'll show you an example of the form that Lichtenberg um, borrowed from Whiteford. Um, Although it was part of there then by these, uh, such uh, these writers, such literary uses of the newspaper cut up became increasingly common in the late 19th and earlier 20th centuries. And the work of such writers as Stéphane Romé, uh, Bien Julien, James Joyce, Tristan Thala, Kurt Fitters, uh, Walter Benjamin, William Carlos Williams, and John Dos Passos. These and other writers produced text that mimicked the juxtaposed articles of the newspaper, as in the Aeolus episode of Joyce's Ulysses, that drew directly on and remixed existing news articles, as in Bien Julian's Julie the True, or the composition of distance, or that simply treated the newspaper itself as a literary text, as in Tala's uh, 1920 Dada's debut in Paris, in which he stood on stage and read a newspaper aloud to the outrage of the audience. A few years later, Sergei Kirtyakov would repurpose Tsara's avant-garde gesture to promote what he termed the literature of fact, hailing the newspaper as the epic and Tolstoy of the 20th century. My recently published paper identifies a renewed interest in news, montage, and collage amongst contemporary poets working in Chinese, Russian, and English. This interest, I suggest, extends a now long-standing and seemingly only intensifying anxiety about how we can make sense of a world of proliferating information and media. And encountering the news today across multiple media and platforms, contemporary writers must negotiate a far more bewildering hodgepodge or mess medley of competing voices, words, and images than that of the 18th century or even 20th century newspaper. In response, poets working in China, Russia, Taiwan, the United States and elsewhere around the world have in recent years developed modes of writing that highlight and negotiate the fragmentary multimedia and global nature of contemporary news media. The key purpose of my paper is not to interrogate individual examples in detail, but is instead to offer a provisional argument as to why we see a similar turn across these literatures. In the first decade, of the new millennium, Russian poetry be began increasingly to respond to news and social media. Take, for example, Stanislav Yvorsky's 
um, we've just heard about before for some other work, but take his 2008 um, work, Kruzhim Slovan, in other words, or Kirill Medvedev's uh, 2001 work, uh, text devoted to the tragic events of September 11 in New York. Like Whiteford's cross readings, these works stage the difficulty of negotiating the overwhelming mix of opinions and voices to be found in the news now is accessed through online news and social media. Hence, Medvedev's poem offers a seemingly random and confusing mix of online opinions, news articles, and discussion. It includes, for example, a wildly inaccurate figure for the number of number killed in the 9-11 attacks, a comment blaming American politics for the attacks, another expressing grief and sympathy, and still another claiming that Nostradamus had, predict had predicted the attack. Yavorsky's poem presents an equally diverse and confusing range of online sources and opinions relating to Russia's 2008 invasion of Georgia. Yedev and Yavorsky's poems are part of a range of contemporary Russian poetic works that appropriate material from news reports, blogs, social media, and other online sources of information. Ilya Kukulian has termed such works documentary poetry and as his terminology suggests, these works resemble to some extent contemporary works of US documentary poetry. Mark Nowak's documentary poem, Coal Mountain College, for instance, sorry, yeah, Coal Mountain College, for instance, incorporates entire news reports into its fabric. Similarly, Monica de la Torre's public domain arranges phrases from letters to the editor published in the New York Times as the United States was preparing for war in Iraq in 2002. And Claudia Rankine's Don't Let Me Be Lonely, an American lyric, repurposes language from the government, pharmaceutical companies, and the news media. Recent examples of documentary poet news works are not limited to US and Russian poetry. Take, for example, Lien Yaldur's uh, 1990 work RR Bar or February 28, which comprises texts taken from the February 28, 1947 edition of the Taiwanese new paper, newspaper, Xin Chang Bo, or New Life News. The poem includes advertisements, government notices, um, and the article about police brutality that sparked widespread protests against the Chinese nationalist government and a subsequent, subsequent bloody crackdown. Excuse me. Or we might cite another Taiwanese example, the 2008 group project, Kwa Diao, Kwa Diao, Kwa Diao, or Cross It Out, Cross It Out, Cross It Out. Like US writer Austin Cleon's popular newspaper blackout poetry, this Taiwanese project created poems by crossing out texts from newspapers and magazines, and also encouraged the participation of the public in the creating of similar texts. Similarly, in mainland China, Yen Jun includes a video montage of news and his multimedia performance and video poem, Fan Dui Yi Qie You Zhu Zhu De Qi Pian, or Against All Organized Deception. I'll give you a So this might fit in with the sort of video and, and uh, music poetry work that um, Ilya Kukulian was just talking about. Um, neither are examples limited to the avant-garde. In the aftermath of the 12, 12th of May 2008 Sichuan earthquake, a large number of poems commemorating its victims circulated widely on the Chinese internet. For example, the poem Haizhe Kuai Tua Di Mama De Shou or quick child quickly grab hold of mama's hand, went viral within days of being posted on the 13th of May and was rapidly adapted into multimedia versions that were uploaded to the internet and broadcast on television. These videos often included background music and they were frequently accompanied by subtitles carrying the poetic text and collages of often graphic news media images of victims of the earthquake. Today, Poems made from material taken directly from news, information, and social media are widespread. 
They are part of a body of work that is variously being labeled conceptual writing, copy poetry, documentary literature, database literature, and resource poetry. Scholars such as Kirill Kachagin argue that the use of news montage in contemporary Russian poetry primarily relates to a shift in poetic subjectivity. However, my paper proposes an alternative way of understanding the use of news montage and collage. As a product of the combined pressures of increasingly dense and complex media networks that, like the 18th century newspaper in its day, seem to render the world simultaneously more knowable and more confusing. It is these collective forces that I think better explain the rise and rise of the news poem across the Russian, Chinese and English speaking uh, poetry worlds. To read contemporary news poems solely as expressions of lyric subjectivity, however altered or dispersed, is to ignore or downplay the emphasis on public and often traumatic events. The significance is hotly contested in the multi-authored texts of news and social media. While the global capitalist system and politics in the age of social media might seem to promote the individual over the collective subject, contemporary news poems suggest an alternative view. They map how the intertwining forces of news media, digital networks, and competing nationalisms and internationalisms produce and negotiate forms of collective and contested identity, new mappings not of the lyric subject, but of multiple and contested worlds. Contemporary news poems not only respond to the current digital information revolution, but also look back to how earlier generations of writers negotiated the rise of modern mass news media. For example, Brian Kim Stefan's, Stefan's digital appropriations of formats, lettering and text from the New York Times recall the use of newspaper text and a range of avant-garde practice from the futurist Stuklut Schwitters to William Burroughs and Brian Geisen's cut-ups and the technological poetry of Lamberto Pignotti. Likewise, Kenneth Goldsmith's 2003 book, Day, which reproduces the entire text of one issue of the New York Times, records Sara's 1920 Dada's debut in Paris. And Pavilas Arsenyev's 2015 ready written series of poems not only cites the Duchampian ready made, but in its verbatim reproduction of news articles, is this one source article also refers to a Russian tradition that includes the Lief writers, such as Sergei Kritikov, who promoted a literary fact in the 1920s. Um, uh, also uh, recalls Vitaly Kormen and, and Alexander Melimit's uh, pulping of the Soviet newspaper Pravda into cutlets or burgers, burgers um, and Dmitry Krigov's extensive use of newspaper and literary performance and artistic works. Just to offer a few samples here, um, and in this poetry performance um, with newspapers, um, he simply reads from this um, article at one point. I'll give you a taste of that. We can't hear. There's a button, Jacob. Uh, you have to press to give oh. the sound free. Fair sound, please, uh, sound. Jacob. Okay, sorry, no sound. Okay. Um, uh, in the, it's not uh, that important. Share screen, I'm... please, please uh, 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 press the button. Uh, share, uh, share sound. In the okay. in the very screen, share screen, please. Uh, mm. the, uh, the the button on the uh, bottom of the page, share sound. Mm -hmm. You have to close again and open again, and then you can press the okay. button. What I might do, because I'm running out of time, I think maybe I'll just go on. I'm, I'm sorry, we'll have to, um, you can go and look online, I'll put the link for that. Um, apologies. Um, so um, nowhere is this, um, this, nor is this contemporary uh, news poetry's relationship to the past clearer than the case of Arsenyev and Goldsmith. Arsenyev and Goldsmith engage respectively with the literature of fact, including Tretyakov's provocative notion of the newspaper as the epic of the 20th century, and with Walter Benjamin, who, thanks in part to Tretyakov, sought to theorize modernity through the newspaper, and whose arcade project, with litany 
of quotations, not infrequently, from the newspaper has been cited in recent years as a key precedent for the database conceptual and cut up cut and paste copy poetry of the present. Goldsma, for instance, directly mimics the arcade's project in his work, uh, Capital. While Arseniev has written numerous essays that respond to Tretyakov's at Tretyakov and the literature of fact. So like the news itself, these news poems from around the world seem to represent a tantalizingly pan-cultural world of global form. They allow comparatives like me to group at least a small subset of the world's literatures into a coherent whole. And yet these news poems are also about the problems with such totalizing visions of the world, including of world literature. They grapple, consciously or not, with the production of our modern notion of the world through proliferating news media and information technologies. And in particular, they highlight the paradox whereby ever larger amounts of information both promise and defeat global connection and understanding. Jürgen Habermas identified the emergence of the modern public sphere with 18th century newspaper culture. More recent scholarship on English newspapers, however, indicates that the dominant trope of the 18th century newspaper was not one of giving voice to public opinion, but instead of listening in to the whispers of the court. Whereas Habermas' notion of the public sphere describes a realm of coherent of contested ideas, 18th century newspapers were more likely understood as like Whitefoot's and Lichtenberg's uh, cross-readings, a confusion of overheard conversation, rumor, and information. Though the scale of information has increased vastly over the past two centuries, the same sense of confusion has persisted, as has the popularity of Whitefoot and Lichtenberg's approach dealing with it. Late 20th and early 21st century writers adopt a similar cross-reading approach to the proliferating voices and information of the internet and social media. We could treat these contemporary poetic negotiations of the news as an extension of the modernist turn to new forms of fragmented subjectivity in response to the impossibility of comprehending an increasingly complex world. Yet, as I have argued, any inward looking focus on the lyric subject, however diffuse, must be tempered by an outward looking recognition of how the poetry of the news presents the lyric as collectively constructed by multiple authors and readers from various media genres and art forms, including poetry, contemporary art, filmmaking, music, journalism, digital and social media, and live performance. <clears throat> for Jameson, Frederick Jameson, the modernist artist responded to the difficulty of cognitively mapping increasingly complex global networks by turning to the subjectivity, to, to the subjective to a tiny corner of the social world, as he puts it, and the inner life of the individual. Jameson can only make this claim by sidelining modernist engagements with a collage-like structure of the news. Contemporary poets, by contrast, extend this engagement, decoupling their poetic texts from lyric subjectivity so that they become instead a means of negotiating the multiple texts and global networks of contemporary media. Contemporary news poems show another side of modernism, one that is still with us today the turn not inwards, but outwards to the myriad news stories and feeds that constitute the collective text of our time. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob, for your fascinating uh, presentation. I think both presentations um, display common features um, of recent poetry, for instance, how it reduces subjectivity, but in different ways. Um, the lyrical criterion, the traditional lyric criterion of a speaking subject um, is diminished and uh, transformed into a multiplicity of authors' voices and so on, whether through the collage of voices or as Jacob had shown us, news media fragments, blackout poetry and so on, or as Ilya show, had shown um, in forms of collaborative um, works uh, when musicians or uh, BGs are working together with poets and so on. Mm, now I will open the discussion. We sincerely thank today's presenters and all of you for your participation and contributions to the discussion.
and um, we hope to have aroused your interest in our volume and also in the International Journal for Comparative Cultural Studies as a whole. Um, we wish you a wonderful day ahead and would be very happy to welcome you again soon at an, another event of the Trier Poetry Center on Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. Vladimir Feshenko from Moscow and now fellow in Trier will speak on the topic language writing, the American-Russian transfers.